We are live. Good evening and welcome everybody to the Roy Chapman Andrews Society Distinguished Explorer Award presentation for this year with this year's honoree, Dr. Sarah Parkak, space archeologist uh, who will be with us here tonight and uh, to whom we will present our annual Distinguished Explorer Award. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our little tribute to all the good sponsors and supporters and the little, other little interesting details uh, that we had in our little pre-roll there. Um, thanks for, for, uh, for logging in early and, and checking all that out. My name is Greg Gerard. Uh, I guess it says it right there, Executive Director of the Bloyd International Film Festival. And I'm so glad that uh, Ruth Carlson and this, the board uh, of Roy Chapman Andrews um, reached out and asked if we, if the film festival would partner with them on this event. It's uh, been a pleasure, and uh, I think we've got some really interesting things to share with you tonight. Not the least of which is a wonderful lecture uh, by Dr. Parkak, and the lecture is called "Towards an Inclusive Future of the Past: How to Make Archaeology for Everyone." Um, so we're really looking forward to uh, learning more about Dr. Parkak, uh, her life her work, uh, and what it all means to the future of all of us humans. Um, before we get started here with the, uh, with the uh, um, uh, introductions, uh, I just want to say, you know, welcome all attendees. Um, glad to have you aboard tonight in our vir the virtual uh, world that we've created here for you. And uh, I wanted to remind you that there's still time to um, – to get yourself in the door for the after party, so to speak. There's going to be a special Zoom Q&A program immediately following Dr. Parkak's uh, um, lecture. And uh, she'll, be, uh, she'll be at your mercy uh, on Zoom. Of course, you have to either be a member uh, or you can, if you're a member, you've probably already received uh, the login for that. If you aren't a member but would like to participate in that Q&A, you can still do it by going to RoyChapmanAndrewsSociety.org slash membership dash support. And uh, you can either make a donation or uh, become a member and uh, someone will send you a link so you can join in all the, all the post lecture fun uh, and ask your question. Uh, we'll be, uh, uh, I believe we'll be doing that around, oh, 7.45, something like that. Uh, so anyway, I am going to uh, give up the uh, screen here to, uh, to someone more directly connected to the Roy Chapman Andrews Society. And I'm talking, of course, about the president of their board of directors. So at this time, I would like you to please welcome the board president, Will Anderson. Welcome, Will. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining us as we present our 18th uh, Distinguished Explorers Award. Uh, by now, I think everyone's very used to, you know, Zoom meetings and virtual events, but, um, you know, for the Roy Chapman Andrews Society Board of Directors, hosting a large virtual event like this is a very new experience, so we are extremely grateful that uh, Greg and Kristen agreed to leverage the skills they developed hosting the virtual Bloyd International Film Festival for our event this evening. Um, we did have something of a practice run earlier today when Greg and Kristen helped us out with a presentation to a number of high school students. Uh, so hopefully we've worked out all our bugs. I think we have. Good. Um, so anyway, the mission of the Roy Chapman Anders Society uh, is to inspire scientific discovery by engaging with contemporary explorers who exemplify the legacy of Roy Chapman Andrews, Beloit's native son. So the presentation to the high school group, as well as the presentation to uh, students at Beloit College earlier today is a very important part of our desire to inspire students to follow in the footsteps of Roy Chapman Andrews and pursue a career uh, focused on scientific exploration. But tonight is the main event and we are excited to have all of you in attendance um, but of course, tonight's event uh, wouldn't have been possible without the help uh, and generous support of our sponsors. So before we get too far into the program, I'd like to quickly uh, read through our list of sponsors. Uh, our our top level sponsors uh, this year, our discovery sponsors, uh, ABC Supply, 
Angus Young Architects, Engineers, State and State Line Community Foundation. Uh, we had sponsors of our uh, our student event earlier. Uh, those sponsors were Larry and uh, Karen Arft, uh, Jim and Helen Olson, Joe and Don Stottleman, uh, Tom and Min Warren, uh, John and Becky Wong, and the Nice Family Foundation. Uh, Explorer sponsors included, again, Angus Young Architects and Engineers, uh, Amy Lokrantz, uh, Western Container, and Paul Wheelis. Uh, we have a number of uh, patron sponsors you can see listed there on the screen. I don't want to uh, uh, take up too much time reading every single one, but we really appreciate our patron sponsors. And we also have a number of partnering sponsors, including the Ironworks Hotel, uh, Resonate Web Marketing, Beloit College, the School District of Beloit, Beloit International Film Festival, Greg Gerard, and Kristen Kazabowski. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for all of our sponsors. It's kind of a weird year this year. Normally we would have a, a dinner that uh, raises quite a bit of funds for us. Uh, so this year we're relying more on uh, encouraging people to become members and of course, all of our great sponsors. Uh, one other order of business tonight. Um, all of you may not know that in the city of Bloy today has been declared Roy Chapman Andrews Day uh, in honor of the event tonight. And so as part of this event, I'd like to read the proclamation that was passed by the city of Beloit, and that proclamation reads, uh, whereas Roy Chapman Andrews devoted his childhood in Beloit, Wisconsin, to the tireless pursuit of knowledge about the natural world, and whereas Roy Chapman Andrews secured his formal education through Beloit schools, culminating in his graduation from Beloit College in 1906, and whereas Roy Chapman Andrews went on from Beloit to become a world famous explorer for New York's American Museum of Natural History, discovering new species of animals, including during a series of daring expeditions to the Gobi of Mongolia, previously unknown dinosaurs, the first nests of dinosaur eggs and fossils of mammals that lived alongside dinosaurs. And whereas the accomplishments of Roy Chapman Andrews are gaining attention and recognition today, both locally and nationally, through the efforts of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society of Beloit. And whereas the legacy of Roy Chapman Andrews will be celebrated virtually on Monday, April 26, 2021, when the Roy Chapman Andrews Society bestows its Distinguished Explorer Award on Dr. Sarah Parkak, internationally renowned Egyptologist, satellite archeologist, and science communicator who is the founding director of the Laboratory for Global Observation at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Now, therefore, the president of the Beloit City Council does hereby declare that Monday, April 26, 2021, be proclaimed Roy Chapman Andrews Day to honor visiting Egyptologist Dr. Sarah Parkak and to recognize the achievements of one of Beloit's most famous native sons, adopted this 19th day of April, 2021. So we're very grateful to the city of Beloit for recognizing uh, the importance of this evening. So moving on, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Scott Bierman, uh, Beloit College president, uh, who uh, we have a, uh, uh, Greg can go ahead and, uh, and uh, start that, that clip. Not hearing it. No.
Thank you for joining us. I am Scott Bierman, and I have the honor of being president at Beloit College. One of the many things the college and the city of Beloit share is Roy Chapman Andrews. Native to the city of Beloit and a graduate of the College of Beloit, he is a distinguished product of both, and we share in our appreciation of his extraordinary contributions to an understanding of our world. At this school, we take enormous pride in offering an education that is fundamentally tethered to the liberal arts practice of learning broadly and thinking deeply, but likewise an education in which students channel their experiences at the college into their professional and personal lives. We do so because we believe that a modern world in particular is eager for the fundamentally human skills that are foundational to a Beloit education. It is also a philosophy that is personified throughout Roy Chapman Andrews' remarkable life. His life of purposeful consequence that was itself born, developed, and nurtured through his youth in Beloit, both city and college. In Roy Chapman Andrews' autobiography titled Under a Lucky Star, he somewhat breathlessly and with unbridled bravado writes about his adventures and accomplishments at the very start of this loving testimony to his own life, he notes, often I've had to sit on a lecture platform when I was going to speak and listen to a long introduction. It bored me stiff and likewise the audience. After having read Andrew's autobiography, I suspect he was certain he could tell his story in a far more compelling way than anyone else. It was appalled when someone presented his life in anything other than one death defying moment followed by another. And he was probably right. Lesson learned. I will therefore be uncharacteristically brief. After all, it is Dr. Sarah Parkak that you came to learn from. Welcome to Beloit, Dr. Parkak. It is wonderful to have all of you with us today. Thank you for being here. All right. Well, we almost had all the bugs worked out. A little audio issue there, but we'll keep moving on. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, um, Scott Bierman, for that. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Bill Green. And uh, Bill Green is the Director Emeritus of Beloit College's Logan Museum of Anthropology and a past board member of the Society who will introduce our distinguished explorer. All right. Um, hold on one second. Oh, here we go. Well, I think we're good. Are, are we going to be able to? Green, but I'll, I'm happy to be here. All right. Are we going to be able to uh, get the audio on the Bill Green intro? Yeah, Kristen's having a little bit of a, a little bit of a bit with that video, so uh, I believe she'll get it started here in a moment. All right. Well, in, in, just in case it's not going to work, I think we'll just press on, and I get the um, the honor of actually presenting the award. And uh, when we're planning for this event. What we had planned to do is I was going to have one of the awards and I was going to pretend to hand it off into the screen and and uh, Dr. Parkak was going to take it from me. But I, I think we're going to skip with all the theatrics and simply um, I'm going to read um, the citation that the, the board has written um, in awarding the uh, um, the Distinguished Explorers Award. And this reads, the Wright Chapman and Andrew Society Dr. Sarah Parkak, Egyptologist, space archeologist, innovator, educator. Your approach to research has led to the discovery of new archeological sites and the application of novel methods while exposing the prevalence of looting. Roy Chapman Andrews pioneered the use of the camera during his investigations of whales and, that of, and the use of cars in the remote Gobi Desert. In 1926, Andrews recognized that most areas on land had already been explored from the poles to the tropics and counseled that 
the youth of the future must change his methods with respect to exploration. You, as one of those future youths, certainly changed archaeologists' methods. Your photographs are satellite image and, sa and satellite imagery, and your vehicles are satellites, neither of which could have been featured in Andrew's wildest dreams. Skeptics doubted your ability to use satellite remote sensing to further archaeological pursuits. Similarly, Roy Chapman Andrews' plans to use camels and cars during his exploration of Central Asia were declared foolhardy to impossible. You, like Andrews, prevailed. In doing so, you have provided insights into the cultures of ancient Egyptians, Romans, and Vikings. Your leadership in Global Explorer, your online platform for crowdsourcing of satellite data, produced hundreds of potential sites in Peru for experts to further investigate. Like Andrews, you have embraced the joy of communicating your research and have taken it a step further by involving the public and diverse groups in online research. In appreciation for these contributions, we are pleased to bestow on you the honor of Distinguished Explorer from the Roy Chapman Andrews Society this 26th day of April, 2021, from Beloit, Wisconsin. So congratulations, Dr. Parkak, on this award. Thank you very much. I am I am very very deeply honored uh, to you, to the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, and uh, to uh, to everyone who's been a part of this. This has been a wonderful wonderful day, and I'm I'm so excited about being able to share um, share my lecture with you. Great. All right. We're ready to ready to go. All set. It's all yours. All right. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, welcome to uh, everybody. Tuning in, I know we're all <laughs> pretty much used to uh, Zoom lectures uh, by now. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope wherever you're tuning in from, uh, spring has sprung. It certainly has sprung from here in uh, Birmingham. It's been a beautiful, beautiful day. I always give a few warnings. Uh, we have a few cats. Um, every now and then they make a visit to uh, to assorted lectures that I've given. So you may see some kitty cats uh, headbutting me um, or popping across the screen. Um, also, we have an eight year old, uh, eight and a half year old. He's very loud, which is great. All kids should be loud. Uh, sometimes he's good. Sometimes he's a kid and he comes in and will wave and say hi. So um, I try to keep him off screen. I don't like to, to, to show his face in the general public just for privacy reasons, um, but you may you may hear a loud mommy and asking permission to do something that his father has said no to, because as you know, that's how kids work. Um, anyway, it's all good. So thank you all for, for tuning in. Thank you all for, um, for joining this evening. Uh, this has been such a huge, honor for, for me. I had the pleasure and opportunity today in the early afternoon of speaking to a number of uh, Beloit area students, high school, uh, middle school, and a number of other people joined. It was a really fun lecture. So for anyone who watched that lecture earlier, the lecture you're about to see is about 96% different. Um, tried to give different material and, and being able to share because I have a lot of a lot of research to share. Um, so again, thank you all for tuning in. I know we're all so busy and pressed for time, um, especially now that the weather's getting better and hopefully um, uh, hopefully things are starting to ease with with vaccines and everything. We're all thinking about the potential of returning to a, a much more new normal. So with all that being said, let me go ahead and share my screen. Get my PowerPoint up. Okay, so uh, okay, we're going to share my screen, and let me get. Um, let's go to window, entire screen. Okay, um, your contents of your screen. Okay, we're going to go to share, and then we're going to go to PowerPoint. And I think we are off to the races. Um, so. What I want to share is something I did share with the students earlier today. Um, you know, this this award for me is in many ways kind of um, full circle uh, because when I was an undergraduate at Yale University back in 1999 to 2000, um, I had the opportunity of working at the Yale Peabody Museum, uh, analyzing uh, material culture from ancient Nubia. 
Um, so there are these amazing salvage expeditions that were done by Egyptologists, um, really trying to, to race against time um, to salvage these incredible archaeological sites um, along, uh, along the Nile in modern day Sudan. And a lot of the material from a couple of these expeditions was stored at the Yale Peabody Museum, where I got to work part of my sophomore year. And in the basement, which is about as basementy as as you can imagine a museum being, um, right above the doorway, sort of leading from one of the collections into um, another part of the collections, or at least the storage, there are these black and white kind of grainy images of this guy in a strange hat um, in a tent in the desert. And the Yale Peabody Museum not only had, you know, amazing Egyptology and archaeological material culture, but it also had a, an incredible paleontology collection. And I asked after a couple of weeks, you know, working in the basement, um, hey, who's that? Who's that guy? What's, you know, what's he doing? Um, you know, who was he? Because I, I didn't know. I was only 19 or 20 years old. And someone told me, oh, that's Roy Chapman Andrews. You know, he was uh, he was the head of the Natural History Museum. You know, a long time ago, and, and a great science communicator. So, really, I that's really when I started to learn about him. You know, I, I didn't know who he was or what he did, and what a privilege and an honor for me to have um, you know started over twenty years ago uh, in in the basement of this museum, looking up to this extraordinary explorer and you know someone who I read about and uh, and you know. Um, learned from and, and was inspired by. And now, of course, you know, here, here we are today. So really, it, it is it is full circle. It, it's such an honor. And I'm just so, so grateful to the Roy Chapman Andrews Society. Um, it reminds me of my young days, really kind of um, just learning, you know, learning about how to be an archaeologist and, 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 and being inspired by these great figures from time. So uh, I should say that the, the beautiful, beautiful award uh, is currently on our son's desk. It arrived in the mail. Our son took one look at it and said, thank you, it's mine. So uh, <laughs> it has a place of pride on, on our son's desk, who is very much a young explorer. Um, I'll be talking to you tonight about Global Explorer. Um, you know, the real theme of my lecture is how to how to make archaeology more inclusive and more accessible to everyone. And um, um, I hope, you know, the main point is, is you walk away from this lecture really having an appreciation for how much, um, you know, how much more is possible now with the use of technology, with the use of citizen science and archaeology, and, and, and how much that you can participate in um, uh, in um, in archaeology today, so so hopefully you'll you'll get to sign up. Um, go to globalexplorer.org, um, and we have a lot of educated resources for the educators that are tuning in. Uh, we love working with teachers, so so hopefully that that you know that will um, allow you to get more more engaged. Well, I had something pretty amazing happen to me about two years ago. So it was just just before the pandemic. Uh, I was on an airplane. Uh, going to you know one of my many many lectures, and I got on the airplane, and I got this weird text message um, from, uh, or no, it wasn't even a text message; it was a Twitter message from someone that said, "Hey, we just saw you on Jeopardy," and I thought, "What? What is this person talking about? Saw me on Jeopardy? That's it's Twitter. Somebody's saying something weird." Um, and I landed after my flight, and I saw about fifteen missed calls and about two dozen text messages. And my first inclination was, oh my gosh, who has died? You know, something terrible has happened to someone. Oh no, and I started to panic because I saw a lot of missed calls from my parents and I just expected the worst. But no, I found out that uh, I had been a question on Jeopardy, um, which to me, you know, as someone who grew up uh, watching Jeopardy, and this is um, two years ago, Alex Trebek um, read my name, and uh, and what an enormous honor to be a, a Jeopardy contestant. So what I wanted to do tonight to honor Alex Trebek, you know, we just we just recently lost him uh, for 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 for, can for from cancer. Um, I wanted to tell you my Alex Trebek story, which I really haven't properly shared publicly before. Certainly not in this in this um, context. So I hope you will indulge me because it's a nice way uh, in to the work that I do and remote sensing work, but also um, into, I guess, ways that I've been inspired and in how to think differently about being a public communicator. So here is my story, and I know it is going to sound absolutely unbelievable to all of you, because it's still unbelievable to me, and it happened to me, but there is photographic proof 
that it happened. So just hang in there and let me tell you my story. So this all started in, um, in June of 2013. Uh, National Geographic was having their 125th um, anniversary celebration in Washington, D.C. So every June in pre-COVID times, uh, they typically have about a week-long explorer symposium where they invite explorers from all over the world and you spend this incredible week together learning from each other and being inspired by the amazing work done by paleontologists and archaeologists and botanists and, and, um, and biologists and conservation specialists. And you're all getting together and it's wonderful. And well, the 125th anniversary was a big celebration. There was a black tie dinner uh, at, a, at a really swanky museum in Washington, DC. And they were honoring at this particular event, um, Alex Trebek for his work with the National uh, Geographic Bee, uh, E.O. Wilson, the great Harvard um, entomologist. Uh, they were honoring um, uh, Sylvia Earle, kind of a great underwater archaeology explorer, or un underwater explorer. It was really this, this great event. So Alex Trebek was going to be there. And all the explorers were just buzzing. And they thought, wow, Alex Trebek, we hope, you know, even just to see him from a distance, to say, we've seen Alex Trebek. He's just this iconic, great American, um, you know, someone who was part of my childhood, all of our childhoods. And I thought even to see him would be great. Well, didn't see him, didn't see him. Well, after a few, you know, a couple days, a friend of mine showed up and said, Hey, um, you know, Alex Trebek, he's, he's in the other room. Do you want to go meet him? And I'm thinking that my friend, you know, is, um, knows him somehow. I'm like, Oh my gosh, Alex Trebek. Of course I want to go see him. This is amazing. I'll even just get to say hi, shake his hand, say thank you. For inspiring me with, with Jeopardy and, and leave him alone. Well, I walked into this room and it became clear in about 0 0.01 seconds that my friend had never met Alex Trebek in his life and that we were busting in on a meeting between Alex Trebek and a very high ranking National Geographic executive. My friend, a gentleman named Fred, um, he's an interesting character and uh, and he he sort of both both Alex and this this person looked up and, and my friend went, Alex, great to see you. Let me introduce you to my friend, Sarah. And my friend pretended like he'd known Alex for years and I clearly had to roll along with it. So um, anyway, I was mortified, of course. And my friend Fred told him, hey, this is Sarah. She works, she does all this great remote sensing work in Egypt. And Alex, um, wonderful, was a wonderful, wonderful human. And without missing a beat, he walked over to a wall. And the wall had, you know, one of these classic kind of 15 feet by 10 foot tall National Geographic maps of the world. And he looked at me and I thought, oh boy, there is a surprise coming. And he said, Sarah, I know you have worked in Egypt, but have you worked in, and he then pointed at the map and pointed at Tunisia. Now I should say, Alex had no idea who I was. He'd never met me before. And he, it became clear, wanted to play this game of gotcha with me because, of course, he knew I worked in Egypt as an Egyptologist um, and, and he wanted to see where else in the world I'd worked. And he was just guessing. I said, well, you know, Alex, funny you mentioned that. Uh, you know, I've just you know, finished up this great collaborative project with colleagues uh, mapping out Roman roads and forts and settlements um, along the deserts of Tunisia. It was amazing. You know, you find all of these extraordinary roads that just show this incredible, you know, thousands of kilometers long road system that the ancient Romans used to help control trade routes to North Africa and collect taxes. And we just mapped all these roads that we couldn't see before by using different parts of the light spectrum invisibly. Maybe you can see them, maybe you can't, but but they just pop out uh, when you process the satellite data. You know, really amazing stuff. We even find things like Roman period forts um, and we're able to map the kind of the scale of what's there. It's awesome. And he looked at me, he goes, wow, okay, I wasn't, wasn't expecting that, but um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna roll with it. We're gonna, we're gonna roll with it. Okay, so you've worked in Egypt, you've worked in Tunisia, but, and he sort of, he was pointing his fingers and going around and around and around this huge map. I had no idea where in the world he'd point. And he said, but have you worked in Italy? And he looked at me thinking that he got me. I said, well, you know, Alex, I'm really glad you asked me about Italy because, um, you know, actually just 
this incredible paper just came out in the Journal of Archaeological Science that I published with my colleagues, uh, Professor Chris, uh, Dr. Chris Strud and Professor Simon Key of Southampton University. And if you've ever flown into Rome's Fumicino Airport, uh, which is just right here, um, just to the south, there's a large hexagonal basis, which was started by the Emperor Claudius in 116 AD, expanded by the Emperor Trajan in 120 AD. Um, and, you know, there's this, it, it was, it was an entrepot.com for the ancient Roman world. All the goods would have been offloaded and, uh, and, and, and sorted and categorized and cataloged. And then they would have gone up the Tiber River to Rome and elsewhere for the elite of Rome. And, you know, one of the big questions that our colleagues had at Portus was, you know, they found all of these um, boatyards and warehouses and other structures, but it was a pretty important city that, that lasted for a while. The question was, could there potentially have been an amphitheater there, you know, like an ancient entertainment complex? And they knew there was probably one there, but they couldn't find it, and they'd done all this mapping work. So I proposed to use high-resolution multispectral satellite imagery to map the fields and to see what we could see. And in processing the imagery and in looking um, at different parts of the light spectrum, because, you know, buried ancient uh, foundations show up differently in different parts of the light spectrum because vegetation res responds more uh, strongly in the near infrared. We can kind of see this blob here. Well, in the near infrared part of the light spectrum, you see this very, very clear 40 meter across, you know, ovoid structure with, with um, you know, I had my phone, I was showing him these images, um, you know, with, with gates clear um, uh, uh, northern um, buildings that are probably places where the uh, gladiators train. You know, you see this clear uh, east-west road and all of these other structures and all of these other features. We used um, LIDAR laser mapping. You can see it pretty clearly. And in fact, we were able to map a number of um, potential river channels as well. Well, he's looking at me like uh he's kind of angry and super impressed and he goes okay i am going to get you in the next question he goes there is absolutely no way that you will have worked in the next country that i have uh thought through he goes just just watch out i said okay try me and he's just looking at me and i'm just looking at him and, and of course it's a game and it's wonderful and it's glorious and you absolutely could not have made this up in a million years. So he pointed and he said, okay, I know you've worked in Egypt. I know you've worked in Tunisia. I know as crazy as it sounds, you as an Egyptologist have even worked in Italy, but there is no possible way that you in a thousand years could have ever done any archeological work in Romania. And he looks at me. And he smiles, he goes, I've got you. I said, yeah, unfortunately, Alex, you don't because I just wrapped up an incredible collaborative project with my colleagues at Cluj University where we worked at the um, ancient Dacian capital capital of Sarmisagutia Regia. You know, it's an amazing site. The Dacians lived there and the Romans went in with back to Trajan again around 120 and they wanted their lead, they wanted their silver. Um, and so we used, um, uh, laser mapping, because of course the site, as you could see, you know, as, as, as I was describing it to him, was covered in trees, um, and so we had to use laser mapping to, um, to to be able to figure out what was beneath all the trees. And here's a an early map. Um, this is what it looks like on the ground, but you can see all you know all the dense vegetation around. It. And you know, lidar is a laser mapping system that allows you to look through point cloud data and and basically get digital elevation models of what's beneath the trees. You strip away the vegetation, and you are left with before and after um, so here's the central part of the site which you can see visually but what we're interested in is this very large um ditch it's a roman classic roman ditch uh fortification system and you could see even the archaeologists they, they worked there for years they couldn't see the forest for the trees we had to use the lidar imagery in order to be able to map what's there well um anyway this is proof that this happened. Uh, here's Alex and I. So at the end of our of our uh, of our discussion, um, he looked at me and I looked at him and I said, "Dude, like, come on." He's like, "All right, you win, you win, you got me." Um, and I asked him for a picture, and he goes, "No, no, we're we're gonna we're gonna do a picture tonight at the big formal event." And he said, "I'm warning you, you know, I I I didn't realize it was black tie. I I sort of went full lounge lizard, but um, it'll it'll be great." So here's a picture of Alex Trebek and I back in 2013. Uh, you know, here's here's to you, Alex. Thank you so much for uh, for being such an extraordinary person, for inspiring all of us, and certainly inspiring me 
to be a better science communicator and, and to giving me a story um, that I will I will no doubt be sharing for, for the rest of, of my life. So on that note, I thought it would be good to dive into uh, my own archaeological work. And you've seen a bit about how satellites can work. Um, you know, one of the great joys of, um, of my life, of my career, has been the opportunity um, to, um, to collaborate with diverse people. Um, you know, the work that I did, it's never me. It's never I found. It's always we found. Um, you know, we, um, I, I've worked with, with colleagues across Europe in the North Atlantic, in Central America, in South America, in Southeast Asia, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit. Um, and, and the core of my work is Egypt. Um, you know, I, I've been an Egyptologist for 20 years. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's just been such an honor and such a privilege to work with the Ministry of Antiquities. So starting in 2011 with the Arab Spring, you know, we noted that there was all this looting going on. So with generous funding from the National Geographic Society, I collaborated with a team of people um, and we looked at the scale and extent of looting across Egypt. This was published in a pretty big archaeology journal a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see just in 2009, 2011, 2012, 2013, this is in the pyramid fields. Um, you can just see there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of looting pits that just appear over one site. Um, and, it, you know, we were able to map at scale and extent. So looting pits show up in a pretty similar way. Um, at archaeological sites around the world. There are these dark ovoid circles, um, and you can see them pretty clearly. So we mapped the number, we mapped the scale, we mapped the extent, um, just to show the density. So we were able to map over 200,000 looting pits at almost 300 archaeological sites and showing the density and where the looting happened and how it happened and why it happened. And to me, you know, the interesting thing isn't that we mapped the looting. Um, although that, that was certainly important. There was a long-standing theory that the looting in Egypt had gotten significantly worse after the Arab Spring. It makes sense. You know, there's, there's instability. Looting is worse in Egypt. Looting is worse in Syria. Looting is worse in Iraq and Turkey and, and Libya and so many other places. That wasn't the story. The story was that in addition to mapping out the looting, we looked at tourist numbers. We looked at inflation. We looked at youth unemployment. We looked at multiple economic factors to try to figure out when the looting had gotten bad versus what happened in Egypt's economy. And the story is so much more interesting and so much more layered as it always is. Uh, looting in Egypt was pretty stable from 2002 up to 2008, maybe a little bit worse up and down, but nothing to really, you know, um, really, really get worried about. But starting in 2009 and 2010, the looting spiked. So it wasn't the Arab Spring that made the looting bad. It was the global recession. The so looting in Egypt got bad after the Arab Spring because it was already bad. It was getting worse. The Arab Spring was the tipping point. So again, it's not, you know, I told the students earlier today in my lecture, it's not what you find, it's what you find out, right? We always have to be digging for the deeper story, the deeper meaning behind the data, because it's never just a simple story. It's always so much more interesting and important. So I want to share with you right now um, the work that I am doing, the work that is ongoing at the archaeological site of Lisht. Uh, this is a joint mission with the Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt. You can see here I've, I've named a number of my Egyptian collaborators. I have Egyptian co-directors, Egyptian experts that I work with. Um, you know, people think that being a dig director is really fancy and that you, um, you have all this power and all this control and all this glory. The reality is my team does the work. I am the facilitator, I am the organizer, but really I'm not. I have this amazing Egyptian team that I work with um, and they're the ones doing most of the work. Um, so I tell people my job as a dig director is to make sure that everyone is safe, everyone is well fed, and everyone has enough coffee and chocolates. So I go and walk about every day on site and I make sure that everyone has coffee and everyone has tea. Um, and if everyone is happy, because that's the key to being a good leader, uh, you, you bring in the best people possible, you allow them the resources and the space and the respect they need to get their, their work done, to put their best foot forward. And as long as they're caffeinated and they're eating good food, they will do great work. So uh, for any of you uh, listening, um, I'm available to, to speak to business organizations as well. Uh, it, seems to, it seems to work in Egypt. So I want to tell you um, 
Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the site. It, to me, it's one of the most fascinating archaeological sites in Egypt. It dates to about 1800 BC. Uh, it was Egypt's capital in the Middle Kingdom. Why is the Middle Kingdom important? It was Egypt's um, capital in uh, in the Middle Kingdom. So this great period of Renaissance. So in the Old Kingdom, you know, everyone knows the Old Kingdom because it was Egypt's Great Pyramid Age. The first intermediate period, which followed, was this period of great drought and economic and social unrest. And after that, Egypt stabilized. So it had this great flourishing of, of, of art and architecture and literature. And it was Egypt's great Renaissance period. And this site, the site of Lisht, or the ancient capital of Ichtawi, which stands for the seizing of the two lands or the united of the two lands, um, is where Egypt's capital was. It was Egypt's capital for over 400 years. It's an incredibly important site. And I was drawn there because of the looting that I noted post-Arab Spring. I've always been fascinated by the Middle Kingdom and by the site of Lisht, you know, compared to the Old Kingdom with the pyramids and the New Kingdom with the Valley of the Kings and all the mummies. We comparatively know very, very little about the Middle Kingdom. So I'm just really interested in all that we could learn. So that's what started my work there. And this is what the looting looks like. You see a deep shaft tomb. You see mud brick covering the site, uh, or covering the... Um, covering the tomb. Um, and this tomb would have been intact. We mapped hundreds and hundreds of these looting pits, and it looks like hundreds and hundreds of these tombs were indeed intact. And these tombs would have been full of coffins and statues and shabtis and, and linens and all these fine goods because the capital of Ichtawi was incredibly wealthy. The two kings, uh, Amenemhat I, uh, the father, and, and Samoset I, the son, that founded the city of Ichtawi. Um, you know, they in, in in creating this capital, you know, it was it was a place where the middle and upper middle classes flourished. All the great stories that we read from the Middle Kingdom were probably written at Ichtawi. Um, you have this incredibly egalitarian society, you know, all these great artisans and craftspeople and tradespeople, they were all living and working at this site. So it would have been wealthy. All these people could have afforded tombs. So I want to talk to you about our work. Um, so it's located in the southern part of the site. Um, and this is a large tomb that would have originally been roofed in antiquity because of earthquakes and quarrying. It's been cut out, so it originally would have had three niches. It would have had a series of columns supporting the hallway, which is right here. So this is at the start of the season with my uh, Egyptian collaborators, Mohammed Yosef and uh, Adel Okasha. We're talking about kind of how to proceed with the work. And that's the thing about archaeology. Again, you think it's this, you know, oh, well, you're you're leading it. You're, you know, you're the one making all the decisions. Archaeology, the best archaeology is only possible when you are consistently and constantly collaborating. So you're constantly having dialogues and talking about ideas and testing theories. Um, really, that is that is the only way to get good work done in Egypt because you know our Egyptian colleagues, they live and breathe this. This is what they do. And uh, they're really, really, really good at it. So here's us working away. You know, we work with a local workforce. We record and document everything. Uh, you can see this is what's called a classic T-shaped tomb. You really see what I mean in a couple minutes. Um, so this this long hallway connecting to, um, or rather, a long causeway connecting to a hallway with columns, three niches. You can't really see it well, but you're you're about to be able to. Now, one of the things that we didn't know as we were digging, you know, we had no idea who this person was. We didn't know anything about them. Was it a man? Was it a woman? Who was he? Was it a them? Um, and over the course of the season, we found his name, which was one of the most exciting days, Intef. Intef was a pretty common Egyptian name, and this is Intef. And, and I told you before, the Middle Kingdom was famous because of its extraordinary art. You can just see the delicate painting. It's still bright orange, um, buried for thousands of years, this gorgeous little side nostril. Um, the facial musculature, you know, it's, it's, this is an amazing, amazing period of time. And this was in death. This was a piece that was in the tomb. We found several in situ, that means in place, um, uh, pieces. So this reads Intef, Mes, and Ipi, Mat Heru, or Neb Heru. Um, so it, um, it, it basically means Intef, born of Ipi, the justified. Uh, and Ipi was his mother. Isn't that amazing? Um, so in his tomb, he is honoring his mother. Who was his mom? We don't know. We think we found some, some sculpture or statue fragments or, or relief fragments of her. This says some Wasrit, who was one of um, Intef's sons. And we learned over the course of the season who Intef was. He was a great general in the, um, in the army. Uh, he, he ran, he essentially was, was the joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was the head of the treasurer, treasury. Um, he was one of Samoset I, this great king. He was one of his close 
confidant. So he merited a tomb in this place. He was very, very wealthy. Over the course of the season, you know, ma making sure the tombs are protected became really important. So uh, we made sure that the um, uh, that the tomb itself was well guarded and well lit. Um, we installed doors uh, because we wanted to make sure that the tomb was protected. You know, this is so, so, so important for the archaeological work that we do in Egypt. Um, we um, really, really want to be sure, um, you know, we work with local communities, local guards, um, you know, everything is kind of locked down so that looters can't get in. We also, it's not just about um, using satellite imagery uh, and excavating, you know, we use state-of-the-art 3D mapping to, um, to, to figure out what sites look like. And in that way, even though you can't go to Egypt, or rather it's hard to visit this site, we took thousands and thousands of data points um, from what's called the differential GPS. And using that information, we were able to map exactly what the tomb looked like. So here we go. Here you see um, this, um, you know, it's, you can see these three niches pretty well. We'll show you what they look like in a second. Uh, it wasn't complete. That's the thing that we learned about this tomb. This this particular niche was started. It wasn't complete. This one uh, was that there was a big statue there that was looted. And this uh, room was partly reused later on. But you really get a sense of the scale of what was there. And this is backed up a little bit. Again, you really see the tomb in context. And there would have been thousands and thousands of tombs like this. It was this massive mausoleum. It was it was like a, a dozen or, or hundreds of New Orleans cemeteries all, um, all put one next to the other. That is the size and scale of this particular cemetery. With the two pyramids of Amenem at the first and Samoasar at the first, of course, they would have been surrounded by the thousands and thousands of people who lived, worked, and then ultimately died in Ichtawi. They would have wanted to be buried close to the kings. Now, in 2016, so that was 2015, 2016, we went back, we excavated the uh, causeway, which you can see here. This is where our wonderful workforce working away, clearing down very carefully. So in archaeology, we dig stratigraphically, so we go layer by layer by layer. Um, and you can see here, this is a beautiful, for all of you cat lovers out there, this is the uh, goddess Sekhmet. And this little amulet probably would have been worn around someone's neck. So you see the little loop right here. Um, so someone's lucky amulet from thousands of years ago. And uh, just just what a what a glorious treat to be able to find these exquisite little objects as you're digging. Little reminders that um, these are people who are just like us. They were obsessed with cats. They loved their animals. They loved their pets. Um, they believed in good luck and good fortune and, and the gods. Uh, religion and faith were, were very important to them. And much like religion and faith are important to so many of us. Um, so it's just ways, it's ways to connect us with who these people were and to try to get us to remember, you know, this we're digging up our ancestors. Uh, maybe we're not directly related to them, but certainly they're the ancestors of the people who live and work in Egypt today. We also ran a field school for a very young, talented Egyptian um, archaeologist, which was lots of fun. We taught them about excavation and mapping and surveying. Um, so that, that was great. And I firmly believe, of course, in, that we continue this. It's so important to pass on our skills to the next generation. So you'll the, kind of the theme of my talk today, you know, it's about ultimately, whenever you have great privilege in a field like science, you know, how do you leverage your privilege? And, and pass it on and train others and empower them to achieve their full potential. That's my goal now in, in archaeology. You know, I've been so blessed um, to be able to work on these amazing projects around the world and run projects and, and, and work with great people. Now it's my job to make sure that that younger people in the field um, and my Egyptian colleagues and, and kids who are tuning in, you know, that everyone has the opportunity to help uh, participate and be an explorer as well. So in 2017, that was our last proper season into early 2018. We'd hoped to go back in, uh, in May of 2020. Of course, with the pandemic, we couldn't. But this just gives you a sense of the landscape. Um, you know, just unbelievably beautiful. We're outside Cairo. It's about two hours south of Cairo. Um, you have this old cemetery here. So it's this interesting melange of the old and the new. This ancient cemetery stops and the new cemetery starts. We would often, um, you know, the, the, the local village would, uh, would have uh, funerals. We would always stop our work to honor the deceased. But seeing the way excuse me, they would bring in the, the coffin and, and, and put the person to rest. Um, it was this eerie sense of timelessness and, and, and things not changing and things not moving because in many ways, these are ancient mastabas. These are like ancient Egyptian um, 
uh, tombs, the ones that, that you saw that were looted before. Um, you also see this, this real uh, change from stark, stark, stark desert to fertile Nile. And for the ancient Egyptians, um, this is the difference between the ancient Kemet, the rich black fertile land that allowed ancient Egypt to flourish and Deshret, the harsh desert land, um, which, which was a place where, where um, evil beings lived. It was not to be trusted. Um, and you really, really get a sense of that starkness of the, the world of life and the world of death. And it was a constant reminder to us of all that we were doing, of all that we were at stake. And again, you see our tremendous Egyptian team working very hard. So in 2017, our goal is to finish excavating the tomb itself, to start conservation, um, and to clear the area around the tomb in addition to doing large scale mapping across the site. So this is one of the most exciting moments. So here you see our amazing Egyptian team and my rice, my Egyptian foreman, uh, Omer. He, um, he's removing this block. And what we found as we pulled this block up was nothing less than the actual tomb shaft of um, Intef himself. So this is a before, and this is what it looked like after. So I mentioned before, this is a classic T-shaped tomb. I was not joking. This is a classic T-shaped tomb, so it's about two meters down. And what you often see in these classic T-shaped tombs, it's not just that they're, the tomb itself, by the way, is not in the niches you saw earlier. The tomb itself, or the tombs, would have been in deep, you know, 5, 10, 15 meter shaft tombs leading down to a series of chambers, which is where these individuals would have been buried. And it's not just, of course, Intef. It's his children. It's his grandchildren. It's his cousins. Anyone who could potentially get a tomb in Intef's tomb would have built one. And then we have, of course, later intrusive tombs. So we did conservation work. We're trying to protect the mud brick. You can see the careful wall that we've put around the site um, in order to protect it. And another shot going from, um, so this is going from east to west. You see the niches that we started in the first season. This is the hall. And you just get a sense of the scale of this tomb. It really would have been impressive. But, you know, so much for the tomb itself. I want to share with you some of the amazing things that we found. Now, I told you that the Middle Kingdom was this incredible period of, uh, of painting, of art, and, and these are objects as they're coming out of the ground, moments as they, after they've come out of the ground, after we've mapped them, um, after we've we very carefully placed them in, in 3D uh, within our, our grid system. You know, we carefully plot all the points because we want to reconstruct what was there to see if we can put it back together. Um, and you see the amazing colors. You know, these, these look so freshly painted. It looks like it was painted yesterday. Um, we very carefully ba bag it and tag it after we record it and send it up for conservation. That's really the most important thing. And I mentioned before that the vivid colors. Look at this. So this is a scene from an offering tableau. You can see grapes. You can see rushes. Um, you can see uh, uh, just beautifully, beautifully painted um, uh, reliefs. Um, so, you know, the, the art, as I mentioned before, the art from this period of time was just extraordinary. And it's probably a bias, of course, it's my favorite period of time in ancient Egypt. This is a great symbol. So the B in ancient Egypt, Nesubiti, stands for the king of upper and lower Egypt. So it's a symbol of kingship. And look at the level of detail. Look at the beautiful wings. Look at the tail. Um, look at look at the body. Uh, just It's just so beautiful. The, the ancient Egyptians had such a deep appreciation for their natural world. And it's inspiring. It's inspiring us. To, it should be inspiring to us today in the face of a, of a global climate crisis. You know, can we honor the natural world in the same way that the ancient Egyptians did? Uh, we were able to find a number of intact pieces of pottery, which is really cool because this is an offering um, stand. Here are several bowls. And you really get a sense of you know, what daily life was like in ancient Egypt. I said before, it's not what you find, it's what you find out. How do you reconstruct past life ways? at these famous archaeological sites. Um, well, we had some challenges, because of course you always have challenges when you do archaeological excavations. Um, so we dug down five meters, and after five meters, we hit water. The water table has risen significantly in the last three and a half thousand, four thousand years. Uh, water is very dangerous in tombs. It can come in really quickly. So the second we hit water, we said, enough. We absolutely cannot have any risk to any of our staff. Um, so the next season, when we go back, hopefully later this year with the pandemic lifting, knock on wood, um, uh, we'll have pumps. You know, the safety of our team is, is, is first and foremost. Anytime our team does any excavation work in tomb shafts, they're wearing helmets, they're wearing masks, they're wearing goggles, and they're wearing protective footwear uh, as well as gloves. You know, 
safety is the same, whether you are a, a villager or whether you are, are from another country, it doesn't matter. Everybody's lives are equal. Everybody is the same on our dig. Um, and, and everyone deserves the same level of care and treatment. So we really make sure that all of our workforce has appropriate safety equipment and protocols, and they know they are going to get into huge trouble from me if they go into a tomb shaft without appropriate safety attire. I've yelled at people before because I don't, you know, sometimes it's people just being fool, foolish and silly or being a little bit lazy and absolutely not. I will, I will take absolutely no risks whatsoever for my team. Uh, we're very lucky to find several things in situ, and situ means in place, as I said before, here's this beautiful offering bowl that someone left thousands of years ago. Maybe it was one of Intef's ancestors um, going to make offerings for his great, great grandfather, you know, it presents this really wonderful scene of, you know, really what life would have been like thousands of years ago. I mentioned before that conservation uh, is, is the core of what we do. So we hired local workmen to make mud bricks in the same way that ancient Egyptians made mud brick. And we, um, we put those on top of the tomb to protect it. Here we have one of our wonderful workmen, Said. He is 100% posing for this picture. He basically said in Arabic, you know, take a picture of me like you'd expect to see in National Geographic. So of course, how could we, how could we say no to him? He's 100% posing, great, great, great uh, excavator. So in addition, to um, you know, the archaeological work, which we did at Intef's tomb, for us, one of the most important things was mapping the scale and the extent of the looting, because each looting pit meant a new Middle Kingdom tomb, new in the sense of it hadn't been mapped before by previous excavations. Um, so here's our wonderful um, mapping team, uh, Dr. Reda Esmet El Arafi and Said Mahmoud. Um, and so they went out every day and did pretty intensive survey work and were able to map all of these tombs. Um, you can see every tomb is different. Some are shaft tombs, so they go down. Some are family tombs. You see multiple tombs. Some are partly dug into the bedrock. Here you see shrines. Some have mud brick. Um, you know, there's no one typical tomb in the Middle Kingdom. There's a diversity of tombs and tomb types, and that's why it's so important for us to document all of them. So this was announced in uh, 2018, so a little over two years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, by National Geographic. Um, you know, it's one of the largest groupings of Middle Kingdom burials ever discovered, so 800 tombs. It is not insignificant, and it's helping us to um, reconstruct what not, what obviously life was like in ancient Egypt, but also death. And so for me, oh, forward a little bit. Um, you know, for me, so, so in order, the irony is, in order to find out about life in ancient Egypt. You, you can't just excavate settlements. And by the way, we're exploring the ancient Egyptian capital of Ichtawi, which is buried beneath the floodplain, and we have a pretty good sense of where it is. Um, in order to figure out who lived there, you have to work in tombs, which is what we do. And so in order to learn about the actual living, breathing people of Ichtawi, you have to analyze their bones. And so we worked with our project a bioarchaeologist, Dr. Christine Lee of Cal State LA, and she analyzed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bones that we had excavated from the tomb, not just of Intef, but in the area. And she said something really interesting that I want to share with you, which we really haven't talked a lot about yet. Um, so, you know, after she's been there and she's analyzing the bones, you know, I'm going on my walkabout and I ask her, hey, you know, Christine, how's it going? And she looked at me, she has a wonderful sense of humor. She said, Sarah, your bones are boring. And I thought, oh no, here we've brought on this eminent bioarchaeologist and she says our bones are boring. And I started to apologize. She says, no, 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 no. It's actually an amazing thing. She said, typically on, on sites in Egypt, because she'd done a lot of work in Egypt, you see, you know, high levels of infant mortality, disease, you know, things that show you that, that, that think, but life wasn't easy. Life wasn't good. And yet what you have at Lisht is a pretty consistent pattern of death. In other words, the people who lived and died at Lisht were healthy. They were well off. They were eating well. The bones are strong. Um, you know, these were this was a very healthy population. In other words, it's exactly what you'd expect to see from a middle and upper middle class cemetery. In other words, the bones matched the tombs. And we weren't expecting to see this at all. So again, in order to figure out who lived in these places, you have to start looking at how and where they died. So um, I, I, can't, I don't want to 
run out of time. Um, I know I'm probably end up going to end up going over a little bit. Um, too much to share with you, but you know, I mentioned making archaeology inclusive for everybody. So it's not just about these projects. We're working with different teams. It's not just about um, collaborating and having jointly run projects with the Egypt Ministry of Antiquities. But it's much bigger than that. It's about how do we get the world to participate in helping us map archaeological sites. So here's the challenge. A little bit of a Debbie Downer for a second. Um, you know, as you all know, we are facing pretty significant challenges with climate change. Um, and oceans are going to rise, that there is no question that in the next 20 to 30 years, oceans will probably rise at least a foot. We're hoping it won't, but at least a foot. So what can we do to stop this? Because so many um, islands, so many communities by, um, uh, by oceans are going to be devastated. And many, many, many archaeological sites are going to be lost. We have the time now to map these sites and figure out what we can save and how we can save it. We've got to work quickly. And we archaeologists doing this kind of work, um, you know, we can't we can't do it by ourselves. I don't like to use the word can't, but we absolutely cannot do this by ourselves. We need the help of the world. And this is where you come in. So that's really the impetus that drove me to start Global Explorer. So this is a um, a result of a funding, very generous funding, million dollar funding from the TED Prize. We built Global Explorer, which is an online citizen archaeology platform um, that um, that we use to um, you know help map archaeological sites. We started in Peru. We're going to India next. Our goal ultimately is to map the world and especially using things like machine learning. So why did we choose Peru? Well, for a number of reasons. First of all, we had great contacts and connections there. We knew their Ministry of Culture was very open to using technology. Um, it's a pretty, you know, aside from the rainforest area in general, it's a pretty uh, deserty country, so a lot of archaeological sites are exposed. They're open, uh, pretty easy to find. So for all those reasons, we and, and and the other major reason is that um, there's great satellite imagery there. So we had all sorts of boxes ticked, and we decided we were going to Peru. And of course, we got the full buy-in from the Ministry of Culture. I went down to Peru a number of times, and let me tell you, that was that was uh, an absolute joy. You know, Peru. The, the people are wonderful. My colleagues are wonderful. I have a number of friends there. The food's incredible, and of course, the archaeology is just extraordinary. So I'm just so, so, so grateful to um, to my colleagues and friends in Peru, other than this, this would not have happened without them. We wanted to make sure that the platform was transparent. So we always shared the number of users, the imagery they've looked at, you know, how, how long the expedition was ongoing. We also partnered with a number of organizations in country. This is Dr. Larry Coben of the Sustainable Preservation Initiative. Um, they help to um, they help work with local women on or next to archaeological sites and empower them and um, really allow them to um, use their uh, their great artistry, making handicrafts in order to sell objects to uh, to tourists um, to help revitalize their economies, help send their kids to school. Um, you know, it was just so, so inspiring getting to meet them. So for me, you know, I think there's this myth around, you know, the, these cultures are to a large extent dead and gone and, um, you know, they're thousands of years ago. That is not true at all. These cultures are in so many cases are, they're living today. You know, these are Inca, the, it, it, so many indi extraordinary indigenous um, Native North American cultures, uh, the Maya. Um, these cultures are not gone. They're not disappeared. They're active. They're living. What can we do to help empower them to help protect and preserve their extraordinary cultures that have been around for thousands and thousands of years? So when I talk about making archaeology more inclusive for everyone, you know, it's, it's not just about global explore. It's about what can we do? How can we leverage this technology to put the power back in the hands of the indigenous peoples um, in, in, in whose hearts and souls the, these cultures live? Still, to this day, we have so much to learn from them. So the uh, platform itself was a game. I should say, if you go to globalexplore.org now, you can sign up. The platform is down because we're busy redeveloping it. We'll be relaunching it later this year. There are 10 levels. Um, you start out by mapping looting. Then you look at illegal construction on sites. You end up moving to discovery. You see all this information. Um, you can see here what looting looks like. And I told you, looting is the same everywhere in the world. It, this could be Egypt. This is exactly what looting looks like in Egypt. So it's pretty easy to detect. Um, you, there are a series of training videos that people take um, and you know you learn what looting looks like on satellite imagery and this is exactly what the platform looks like we wanted to give the users an experience virtually identical to the work that we do in mapping archaeological sites so here you see the satellite image 200 by 200 300 by 300 meters in size 
Um, you see an area and you mark there's looting or no looting. There's a site or there's no site. Um, you've, you've gone through and done a lot of examples. If you're confused, you've revisited the tutorial. And I can hear some of you going, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're showing a map. You're showing where there could be archaeological sites. Isn't this going to lead the looters right to where the sites are? Well, here is what I'm asking you. Where's the GPS information? Where's the latitude and longitude? Where is the map? The only GPS information on this image is given to us at Global Explorer, the back end. No one else has this data. And then we ultimately take all the findings by the people using the platform and we share it directly with archaeologists at ministries in country. Now, of course, data can always go missing. Data can be stolen. That's an issue everywhere across the world. That, that, that doesn't matter where you are. Even the US, Canada, Europe doesn't matter. But we have the highest levels of security and data protection possible. So there's no way that people can go from uh, a site they find on Global Explorer to Google Earth or any satellite imagery and, and find it. It's just, it's just impossible. So you can see we partnered with a number of other entities and organizations. Don't have time to talk about them. Uh, but you know, as I said before, the archaeological features are pretty easy to find in places like Peru. So here's a large Inca fortress that's on top of um, a mountain area. Uh, we partnered with National Geographic. They provided uh, some pretty amazing storytelling venues. So they shared all of the, these wonderful old stories that have been done um, in and around Machu Picchu. Here you see Machu Picchu itself. I've had the chance to visit. It truly is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I've been all over the world and it's just absolutely breathtaking. So to date, um, uh, I should say 2019, um, we've had over 100,000 people from over 100 countries who've looked at uh, over 18 million satellite images, and they've uncovered uh, over nearly 30,000 potential archaeological features, um, and over 700 of which are major archaeological sites. Uh, we've worked with colleagues, we've helped to identify them. So here you have um, all the countries in the world where people have um, uh, come from, you know, we're missing some countries in Central um, Central Africa, we're missing, um, we're missing uh, Greenland, obviously part of Denmark, and we are missing North Korea. So I've always joked, if anyone knows Dennis Rodman, uh, and the next time he's heading over to visit with Kim Jong-un, can we just throw Global Explorer on an iPad? It's probably not politically um, correct, or, but, you know, I, I want explanation to be for, for everybody. So maybe he can, he can get on the platform and, and help find it, uh, help, 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 help find sites. Um, now, for us, I mentioned before, you know, again, it's not just about working in countries. Uh, it's all it's it, it, doing the archaeological work. It's about empowering local people with the tools uh, that they need and or, or desire in order to make them, you know, able to do the best jobs they can. Um, you know, these these individuals, these archaeologists, are so talented. They're so passionate. They're brilliant at what they what they do. And so we're able to provide very high resolution satellite imagery um, to our collaborators. So this is Dr. Um, uh, Louis Jaime Castillo, uh, who was Minister of Culture for a while. Uh, he's a professor at Catholic University in Lima, really extraordinary individual, done amazing work with, with drones. And he and his team took our data. They were able to map a number of new Nazca lines using drones. For us, this is so exciting because that's the point of the platform. Ultimately, we provide this data to, um, to local archaeologists. They then take the data and do with it exactly what they need to do in order to do the best jobs possible. So I want to wrap up by talking to you uh, about our um, uh, about the work that we're doing right now in uh, in India. So we've gone to Peru. We're now going to India. So this is a close partnership, working and generously funded by the Tata Trusts in India in Delhi. Uh, this is a close collaborative project with the Indian uh, Ministry of Culture, specifically the Archaeological Survey of India. You know, when I talk about making archaeology inclusive, you know, we as an organization, we at Global Explorer, don't go into countries and tell governments, "Hey, this is what we're doing." You know, that's unethical. It's colonialist. We need to change the conversation. Uh, what we do. After lots of you know feelers and backing and forthing and getting a sense is the country interested in the work we're doing, when we start to sit down with governments and partner organizations and country, we say, hey, this is who we are as an organization. Here's what we do. Here's what we've done in other countries. Here is a menu of what we can do for you. What would you like done? What are your goals? What are your aspirations? What is urgent? What would you like to see done in the next one, five, 10, 20 years? Um, what do we not have listed here that we could potentially do collaborating with you? And so we always let the in-country 
uh, governments and partner organizations guide what we do. Now we're clear, you know, we can't do everything. We just can't. We have to be realistic what's possible with funding and timing and staffing and technology. But what do you want done that we maybe aren't thinking about right? Or how can we leverage resources in country and we collaborate? You know, it's a start. It's how you build trust. Um, so this is a project that's been three years in the making. Um, so as I said, we're in the process of rebuilding the platform right now. We're going to be launching in a number of states, hopefully later this year. But for those of you that haven't been to India, the, the, the culture there, the archaeology, the history is mind blowing. There are dozens and dozens of, of, of diverse and extraordinary cultures going back many, many, many thousands of years. You know, extraordinary temples and step wells uh, and settlements and, and religious and holy sites. Many of which are revered today and worshipped today. You know, there's so many active, living, amazing cultures and places in India. So it's such an honor and such a thrill to be able to um, to work there next. And you know, we're going to be there for a while. There are 30 separate states in India, as I said before. We're, we're launching in a couple states. Uh, we're probably going to be starting in in Gujarat, uh, which which contains, of course, um, uh, part of um, you know. Of crossroads of Silk Roads, so many diverse cultures are there. Um, just, just an extraordinary place. And we'll be adding on states over time. We're going to be incorporating a machine learning element into the platform. You know, right now when you go on, or before when you got on, sometimes images had cloud cover. Sometimes they, um, uh, you know, they, the images were a little blurry. But what we're doing with the machine is we're getting rid of all the cloud cover. We're getting rid of all the bad imagery, and we're training the machine to identify potential archaeological features, which then it will feed back to the crowd and the crowd will be prioritizing and analyzing and assessing those features as discovered by the machine. So it'll be a better user experience for our audience. We'll train the machine to go faster and faster and faster. So the machine learning component, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not like the machine is finding the sites. It's only finding areas that have a high likelihood or high probability of being archeological sites. So users, you know, before you'd have to go through 30, 50, 100 tiles before you find a specific archaeological feature. Now you'll probably see an archaeological feature every image or every other image. So it's always about improving the experience for the users because ultimately we're grateful. We're grateful to our wonderful users from around the world. As I said before, our goal is to map the world. Um, you know, we're going to be adding other countries in the next couple of years. Um, obviously, as the pandemic lifts, we'll be able to add more and more and more. And our goal is to get millions of people around the world helping to find archaeological sites. And by the way, this is not a fake experience. You know, our, we analyzed the efficacy of the crowd, and typically the crowd had between an 85 and 90 percent success rate in identifying archaeological features. That's not that much worse than people like me who've been trained in this for 20 years. So as, as you see on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, when, you know, when they do ask an audience, the crowd is wise. People are really good at this. They get good. Uh, they get better over time. So again, we're so grateful to the people that, that have helped us. I invite all of you to go to globalexplorer.org, sign up. We'll be launching later this year. You know, we've had people using the platform from five to almost 100 years old. It truly is family friendly. We, we're hoping to inspire people all around the world. Um, not just to be archaeologists, because you are when you when you when you use Global Square, you're a citizen archaeologist, but to help us protect and preserve our heritage. Because ultimately, and given where we are as a world, I say we say in the end, we envision a world where our cultural heritage data is shared openly, widely, and with great relevance for all informing global decision making. Right now, as a world, we are in a very tough spot, as all of you know. The COVID uh, virus is raging. There are variants that are splitting off. Um, there, are, there are tens of millions of people around the world that have gotten the virus. Uh, hundreds of millions of people have had their lives completely upended. Or, you know, look, here I am on, on Zoom. I would far rather be in Beloit right now uh, talking talking to all of you, getting to meet you, getting to spend time with you. Um, but, but here we are. We're, we're in a different world. We're having really difficult conversations right now uh, about, uh, in our own country, about race, about uh, white supremacy, about uh, migration. About the value of diversity, you know, and I think ultimately we are a better world for our diversity, uh, and that's what archaeology shows us. You know, it shows us the extraordinary accomplishments and achievements of the ancient Egyptians and the Inca and and the the people of uh, the Great Zimbabwe and the Maya and indigenous Native North Americans and so on and so on and so on. All these amazing cultures, these amazing peoples with language and music and art and architecture. And it's just, it's who we are. It defines who we are. Diversity makes us a better species. Um, you know, the world would be pretty boring if we were all the same. 
Um, and, and, you know, look, look at America, everyone calls it a melting pot, but it's really not, it's more like a salad. It's kind of a distinct stew. It tastes great all together, but there are all these wonderful bits and parts that kind of fit together. Um, you know, I think ultimately that's what archeology span has to teach us. It shows us this, this great, this, our extraordinary background, all these extraordinary living cultures, and also um, how we define our humanity, right? Our humanity is defined through great creativity and through ultimately through resilience. With all these big challenges we're facing today, guess what? We have been facing them for thousands and thousands of years. We will survive this, we will get through it, we will be better for it. You know, we're having big conversations right now about the middle class, and guess what? And the importance of the middle class for, for our own economy. And guess what? That's the story of Lish. That's the story of Ichitawi. The Middle Kingdom thrived because old power structures broke down. And there's a new rise of the middle class. And there was a far more equitable distribution of resources. And far more people were able to learn how to read and write. And they could rise in the bureaucracy that was created around the country. So we had this great period of resilience and this great renaissance period because of the rise of the middle class what's going to happen now in America, what's going to happen around the world. We're having conversations around universal basic income and just how important that is. Take the money away from the billionaires, redistribute it. You know, These are the lessons that the past has to share with us. That's why I'm so, so hopeful about our future because I'm so deeply rooted in our past and our past shows us just how resilient we are. And ultimately, that's the gift I want to give all of you to be able to participate and understand our extraordinary creativity, our extraordinary diversity. And ultimately, I'm, I'm hoping it gives you so much hope for, for our own future. So I thank you all so, so much for this amazing opportunity to speak to you. I'm so, so deeply honored um, by this incredible uh, award. I will cherish it for, for my life. I will um, you know, like I did when, when I was 20 years old in, in the basement of the Yale Peabody Museum. You know, I want to take the, the lessons of Ward Chapman Andrews and his passion for, uh, for communicating to the public um, and, and really to kind of take, take that seriously and think, you know, how can I be a better public science communicator? How can I continue to give back and, and help inspire the next generation of, of Roy Chapman Andrews? Honorees. So thank you so, so much. And I think uh, that being said, um, I will leave it open for questions. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Parkak. Uh, I really, I personally really enjoyed that. And I think for those of you in the audience tonight who uh, have studied uh, Roy Chapman Andrews, you know that, you know, what was unique about uh, Roy Chapman Andrews was he had a passion for his field work and that in sharing his passion, uh, he inspired the imagination of the entire nation. And I think uh, the Roy Chapman Andrews Society Board of Directors couldn't have chosen a, a better person uh, to give this award to this year uh, because you, you just exemplify uh, so much what uh, Roy Chapman Andrews was all about. So thank you very much for that uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I really enjoyed that. And it really sparked my imagination as well. I really enjoyed, especially the part about the ball. And I just imagined somebody leaving that um, as an offering. Uh, so it was very inspiring to me. So thank you very much. And um, we're now at the, uh, the, the point of the evening where, uh, first of all, I'd like to, again, thank all of our sponsors, um, especially uh, ABC Supply, uh, Angus Young, Architects, Engineers, State Line Community Foundation, um, for uh, being discovery sponsors. And um, in this uh, COVID environment where we have you know, limited opportunities to fundraise, uh, it is uh, more important than ever that those who believe in the mission of this organization uh, show that support uh, through uh, being members. You can uh, become a member uh, through our website. And if you do it uh, very quickly, uh, you can get an access code uh, to join us in a um, uh, a meet and greet question and answer period that immediately follows uh, this event. Uh, for those of you who are already members uh, and our sponsors, uh, you were sent uh, a registration code uh, earlier before this meeting. Uh, we are going to sign off from this meeting here shortly. And if you will follow that link, uh, that, that Zoom link, uh, we will be reconvening here in about five minutes. Um, and so, Again, uh, uh, now's your chance to uh, become a member. Uh, it just takes a minute and we will have, uh, uh, we'll be monitoring uh, those that, that join uh, late so we can get you that code. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, sign off 
uh, this event and we're gonna transition over uh, to our question and answer session. Great. So we'll see you shortly, Dr. Park.